they're not going to go in any order. Um, okay, so this session is um, on junior liens. Uh, and um, we're going to start with Ron L. Uh, Hello, my grad school TA, who is going to. <laughs> Is that, fun? <laughs> is that funny? Um, is that, so, um, Ron L., my grad school TA, who is going to talk about does junior inherit refinancing and the blocking power of second mortgage? So, this is a joint work uh, with Philip Bond, uh, Sharon Garintal, and David Musso. And of course, the usual disclaimer applies. Um, and as usual, actually, I feel like I'm following in Paul's footsteps, as you'll see. <laughs> so, uh, so, indeed, this is about second liens. About a quarter of all homeowners today have got, that have a mortgage also have a second mortgage, another mortgage. Uh, and the fraction was even higher, actually, in the period that we look at. Uh, it was about 30% in 2000. Um, so, but what, what makes a second mortgage a second mortgage, or more precisely, what makes a junior lien a junior lien? In most cases, it's time priority. The one that was taken out first is senior. Now, uh, that makes sense, but it becomes an issue when uh, the homeowner tries to refinance his first mortgage. Um, so refinancings are now over half of all new originations, uh, and the benefit from refinancing is quite big, right? Um, on average, about $3,500 per year. Now, the issue is that under strict time priority, uh, following uh, refinancing, the new first mortgage would actually be second, would be junior to the second mortgage, unless the second mortgage agrees to be to remain junior. Now, the questions we're going to look at in this paper are, number one, does this impede refinancing? Uh, and secondly, does this help us uh, identify a causal effect of refinancing on consumer credit worthiness? Our answers are going to be that refinancing rates are about 15% lower for the affected population under strict time priority. So in other words, this rule of strict time priority uh, reduces refinancing by about 15%. And also, in addition, we're going to see that after controlling for selection, we find that refinancing lowers subsequent mortgage default rates, but not uh, those on other forms of consumer credit. So, um, all right. So how are we going to identify the effect of time priority on refinancing? We're going to do that by using cross-state legal variation. Uh, so, and this actually is not, wasn't so trivial because this, is, uh, this, uh, this state level variation is actually case law. Uh, so 10 states have adopted what's called the restatement, uh, which means that uh, the new mortgage, if you refinance your first mortgage, the new mortgage that replaces it can retain the seniority of the first one as long as it doesn't hurt any of the other lien holders. And there's a, a specific definition of what doesn't hurt mean, the interest rate is lower, the principal is no higher, and the term of the mortgage is no shorter, so that the payments are not higher. Okay? That's called the principle of equitable subrogation. Subrogation is a legal term which means take the place of. So the new mortgage can take the place of the first one. We're going to call these easy subrogation states. Uh, and this is just to give you a map of the, the dark states are the ones with the easy law. The lighter colored states are the ones in which you have time priority. Okay. Now, uh, refinancing. So in the states where time priority applies, we're going to call those not easy states or hard states in the paper. Um, refinancing could be harder in those states for several reasons. And there's more uh, on this um, later. We're going to try to get at this a little bit later. But a few reasons could be that if you actually need the permit. So let me actually take a step back, uh, something which is not on the slide, which is you might think that uh, the second lien holder would always agree to a refinancing the first lien. Why? Because uh, if you lower the interest rate on the first lien, that's going to make it more likely that the homeowner can also keep paying the second lien. So it should be good for everybody. However, um, there could be a few impediments that may actually make refinancing harder, okay? And, make, and might lead uh, the second lien holder not to agree to the refinancing. First of all, it could just be hard to get in touch with the second lien holder, right? So you have to find, if you live in a not easy state, you actually have to find the second lien holder, 
and get them to agree. So it could take time to get in touch with them and maybe they're swamped and so maybe they don't get back to you and you, uh, you don't end up refinancing. Alternatively, you might try to bar they might try to bargain with you and I'll give you some examples on the next page and, uh, and there's a risk of breakdown in that bargaining. So how, wh why is the, might there be bargaining? Well, uh, there are several ways, several games that the second lien holder could pay, could play, and in fact, uh, the popular press uh, suggests that actually these scenarios occur. First of all, the second lien holder could say, all right, I'll agree that you can refinance your first lien, but you have to do it with me, right? I want the business. So uh, that's something that occurred. Secondly, if they think that you're risky, they might say, no, I don't agree. I don't want you to uh, refinance. And, um, and therefore, and why are they doing this? They're doing this so they can get repaid. And they might do that in the case of a riskier borrower. Okay, and we're going to try to get at these, uh, if I have time, a little bit later. Okay. Now, um, so I showed you this picture, and you, you were looking, I saw Larry looking at these states and thinking, I'm, I'm imagining, he was thinking, well, these states, there's a lot of other things that were going on in these states during this time, right? And so we were also worried about that. So, um, um, and we're gonna and we're gonna come back and deal with that. But just on this slide, I just want to point out there are many other state laws uh, that could affect whether uh, you you know how your mortgage is treated. And you're gonna, I think, talk about some of these right uh, late uh, tomorrow. And uh, uh, for example, deficiency judgments, judicial foreclosures, some states have longer timelines for um, for foreclosures. So there's there's a lot of state differences. Um, and, uh, but this, uh, and there's also papers that talk about, uh, and there's some people, is there anyone here in the audience from that? Uh, there's also uh, reasons why, um, why second mortgages might uh, matter as well, right? Um, but what's, uh, what's different about this paper is that what we're going to look at is the interaction between second mortgages and a state law. And I'm going to argue that gives us uh, quite a lot of power in identifying our results. Okay, so just a word on the data. So the standard data set that many people like myself have used, uh, like for example LPS, uh, that's not going to be enough. Why? Because we need to identify refinancings and in LPS the unit of observation is a single loan. Okay, so we know if the loan terminated, we don't know why. Uh, in addition, we also need to be able to identify the homeowner's other mortgages, their second mortgages. So what do we do? We put the mortgage data, something I've done before, you put the mortgage data together with consumer credit bureau data, and uh, that allows you to, first of all, identify the refinancings, and then also identify the second mortgages. Okay, how do we identify the refinancings? For a loan that terminates in LPS, we call the loan a refinancing if there's a new mortgage open shortly afterwards in the credit bureau data, and if the uh, scrambled address, so Equifax scrambles the uh, address, but the uh, secret is that uh, the scrambling algorithm is, is uh, the same over time. So the address, uh, so if the scrambled address doesn't change in the year following the termination date, then you call that a refinancing. Okay, so what are we doing? Okay, so we're going to first look at the effect on refinancing in 2009 for prime mortgages that were active and current as of December 2008. Why do we look at 2009? The information we have on the laws is current as of September 2008. In addition, and these laws did change a little bit uh, after that, in addition, rates dropped significantly during 2009 that created a big incentive to refinance. Okay. So um, uh, another thing that's worth noting is that this law, these laws regarding time priority, the subrogation law, should have the greatest bite if the homeowner is close to negative equity. So in the paper, we have a model that illustrates that. But the basic idea is that if someone has a lot of equity in their house, then they could just roll both mortgages into a new loan, and the law should not be that important. Conversely, if they have lower negative equity, then refinancing in general is going to be difficult whether or not you have a second mortgage. So the laws that govern the priority of the first versus second mortgage, we argue, are going to have the biggest bite when the homeowner has, uh, is very close to, but not, doesn't have negative equity. Okay. And, uh, and we calculate the 
the CLTV of the house and the equity position in the standard way by using the updated principal balance, second mortgage balances from the Bureau data, and the core logic uh, zip code level HPI. Okay. So now, uh, as I showed you, the, the, we, had, we saw a picture of the states that have the easy uh, subrogation law and the states that had that follow strict time priority. And you know, we want to be sure that we're not just picking up some other variation across states in the legal environment, like I mentioned, or in the economic conditions. And in fact, we know that the bus hit the easy states disproportionately, for example, Arizona, Florida, and Nevada. So we include fixed state fixed effects. Okay? So how can we then identify the effect of the law, which itself is state level? Right? So the law varies across states. We have state fixed dummy variables. How do we identify the effect of the law? Our identification comes from, from a three-way interaction. So we interact uh, the subrogation law, whether or not the borrower has a second mortgage, and the borrower's total net equity position. So in other words, oh, we're, what we're assuming, the kind of exclusion restriction we're making, is that only the subrogation law is going to affect borrowers differentially depending on whether or not they have a second mortgage and depending on whether the CLTV is low, intermediate, or high. Right? So in other words, there could be laws that affect borrowers in different states, but they won't, the, the effect should be the same whether or not they have a second mortgage. Similarly, oh, good, thank you. Similarly, um, uh, okay, so I better go on then. All right, so uh, I'll show you in a picture uh, from, sorry, in these summary statistics, we get the basic idea of the uh, results. So the basic idea is that I divide here the population into low combined LTV, CLTV, high combined LTV, so above 95%, and then people in the middle, from 75 to 95, in the paper we show that doesn't matter. And here we break up the states into easy states and not easy states. So these are the ones where it's strict time priority. Here's where you, can, you don't need the permission of the second lien holder in order to refinance the first and have it retain its priority. And the point is that, in general, we have... Um, it, easy way to see this is, in general, we have lower refinancing rates in easy states than not easy states. However, uh, that's not the case. The, the exception to that is, is in the, uh, right here in the middle CLTV region. In the middle CLTV region, if you have a second mortgage, then, and you live in a not easy state, a time priority state, then you are much less likely to refinance your mortgage. You have a refinancing rate of 16% versus 19% if you don't have a second mortgage for the same total equity position. Okay. However, in an easy state, there's essentially no difference in the refinancing rates. So this right here, this middle cell right here, shows you what's at work in the paper. Uh, all right. So um, I don't have much time, so I'll just mention that another way that the Set that the subrogation law could matter is, is through the conforming loan limit. In particular, during this time, it was very hard to get a jumbo loan. And if your second mortgage pulls you over the conforming loan limit, that could be that, that's another instance in which the state subrogation law could matter a lot. We find evidence for that as well. Okay. So I'll skip the, uh, the results are all fairly straightforward. So we find a significant effect of the law in the middle CLTV region where we expect. The other things have the expected signs. Let me just go over in the last three minutes, I'll talk about the economic impact. So one, um, what, what we're able to do, so it's very interesting and there's, a, there's policy implications for how to, um, for, uh, for this legal difference. In addition, however, what we do is we use these legal differences as a source of exogenous variation in the ease of refinancing. So the question that we're interested in addressing in the second half of the paper is the one that's actually addressed by um, another paper uh, tomorrow, which is, uh, does refinancing reduce default rates? And the problem is that refinancing is an endogenous decision, and so, um, and so it's very difficult to argue there's a causal effect from refinancing to, um, to lower default. In fact, it could just be that there's an unobservable difference, uh, unobservable way in which the borrowers uh, are better. 
Okay, and that, that's why they're able to refinance. Okay, so, um, so however, um, uh, and in, you can see right here that in general, refinancing is associated with a more than 50% drop in default uh, on all forms of credit, mortgage credit, credit card, and auto loans. Okay, now, uh, so what do we do? We use subrogation law as an instrument for refinancing. And the other instrument we use is local variation in the conforming loan limit. So the idea, the basic idea is this can affect the ease of refinancing, but shouldn't directly uh, affect uh, default. So, um, and so we implement this, and this is why I said I was walking in false footsteps here, right? So the advantage of this approach versus some other papers is that we can look at refinancing directly rather than trying to infer it through the effect of rate resets on arms, not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, rather than doing that, we can look at refinancing directly. And we also are able to look at the impact across different forms of credit. So we estimate, we compare a naive probit model of, refinan of where we estimate the effect of refinancing on default, and we get these big effects along the lines of what I showed you in the table. Then what we do is we estimate a bivariate probit with of the joint refinancing and default decision, with the exclusion where we exclude the three-way interaction of the state laws and also the local variation in, um, in jumbo states. And so, uh, and the idea is that they shouldn't affect default directly except through their effect on refinancing. So when we estimate this, we get, uh, just to summarize, we get that the uh, impact of refinancing is cut by over 50%, but it's still significant refinancing uh, reduces default by 1.3 uh, percentage points relative to about 3.6% overall. So it reduces it by about a, uh, a third, a little less than a third, about 30%. And, uh, we, the, negative, and it, the model suggests that selection was indeed a relevant concern. And it also makes the effect on other forms of credit insignificant. Now I've run out of time, so I'll just conclude. Uh, so there's a new look at the law that hasn't really been considered by economists. We find a significant impact of this law on refinancing exactly in those cases where we would expect it to matter. And then we use this law and variation in conforming loan limit as sources of exogenous variation to study the impact of refinancing on default. Okay. We'll be our discussion from James. James. Victor, where is he? He's right here. Okay, so thanks a lot to the organisers. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, usual disclaimer, I'll say no more. Uh, so this is a very nice paper. So this is, really, this is a paper about refinancing frictions. Uh, so I wanted to start by just giving a little bit more general motivation. So, okay, you know, why does this matter? Why do we care so much about refinancing? I mean, a big part of this comes back to the fact that you know, a large fraction of mortgage borrowers in the US have sort of long-term fixed rate mortgages. So that's, if you look in LPS, uh, as of 2013, it's 83% of the stock of outstanding loans, which might be a bit of an overestimate, but it's a large fraction of the mortgage debt out there. So the interest rate is only going to change if the borrower refinances. Okay, but uh, you know, a situation where, like the one that we went through during the sample period, uh, interest rates are falling, but people are having trouble refinancing either because their home value has fallen or because there are other frictions in the refinancing process. And this is really talking about one particular friction, which is sort of this tranche warfare uh, between the first lien and the junior lien. So the extent that there are some problems either locating the second lien or, or in negotiating with the second lien, that that, that can reduce refinancing. Um, and, you know, why does this matter? I mean, I think this matters for a lot of different reasons. Uh, you know, one, one way in which it potentially matters is it affects the monetary transmission mechanism. And the HARP program that was implemented during, you know, in the wake of the crisis was an explicit attempt to try and improve the pass-through of lower long-term interest rates to, to mortgage borrowers. Uh, and there is even these sort of proposals out there to sort of change this, the contract structure so that there's an automatic sort of a refi in the rate or automatically occurs if market rates fall rather than the borrower having to explicitly refinance. Uh, so I think this is kind of a very interesting topic for research over, you know, in the sort of broader, these broader questions. Um, I'll sort of skip this part, but so this is kind of, you know, this is sort of a background for this paper. So what's this paper doing? So it's sort of starting with the, so I didn't really know too much about this, the legal part of this. It's, it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, so in most states, 40 out of 50 states, lien status follows time priority. 
So I think the analogy here is that you're waiting in line at the DMV, uh, and it's a long line, and then you have to you know, get out of line to go to the bathroom for a couple of minutes. Uh, when you get back in line, you have to go back to the end of the line, or can you jump back in place uh, where you were before? And maybe you can kind of talk to the guy behind you and say, look, can you mind my place? But maybe you don't completely trust him, or you feel embarrassed asking. Uh, so maybe that makes you less likely to go to the bathroom in the first place. That's kind of the analogy uh, that we're thinking about here. So in the mortgage context, uh, you have a first mortgage and a second mortgage. You refinance the first mortgage, so the first mortgage disappears. The second mortgage becomes senior. Uh, and then you know, this refinanced first mortgage, it's the same size in this case, uh, is now junior to the, to the junior lien, to the originally junior lien. So to avoid this kind of queue jumping, um, there's various things you could do. One thing the paper doesn't talk too much about is ex ante, you can sign an intercreditor agreement between the two lenders uh, to kind of agree to, to respect the lien status even in case of refinancing. Uh, ex post, you know, this junior lien can resubordinate, which is what Ronell talked about. Uh, or if you refinance both mortgages at once, then you, you get around this because uh, you know, there's no, they both, they both uh, become newer loans. Uh, so the null hypothesis is basically an application of the Coase theorem, which is yeah, if there's some benefits uh, to, to these parties jointly in redoing the refinancing, uh, then you know, it'll occur and it doesn't really matter uh, whether you have this, this junior lien or, this, or, or not. Um, and, but what they find in practice is the refi rate uh, is about 15% lower you know, within this particular population. So this is in time priority states relative to uh, equitable uh, subrogation states. Uh, for these kind of middle CLTV loans. So these are loans where if the CLTV is very low, then you can just, it's going to be easy to refi both mortgages at once. If the CLTV is too high, you're not going to be able to refi anyway. And then there's this kind of Goldilocks region in the middle, uh, which is what they look at, and they find this sort of significant effect in that region. And Ronell, you know, I think that those summary statistics that Ronell went through, I think, very much tell the story of the, of the paper, the regression results, very much sort of, you know, are consistent with that. So there's some kind of barriers to renegotiation here. Um, I won't go through, you know, so it's really kind of a triple interaction effect. So it's these states with equitable subrogation uh, among, so the thing that they're really using for identification here, since they don't have time variation in the legal environment, um, is, you know, you look at loans that have a second lien attached to them and then loans that are, you know, interactive with being in this particular CLTV bucket. Um, and there's a lot of, as well as the kind of main result, which is that, you know, this, this C parameter here is, is greater than zero, there's a lot of interesting heterogeneity. So... This effect is larger for small balance mortgages. Um, the effect is mitigated, so they have sort of a way of trying to tease out or, or guess at whether both liens are held by the same bank, right? So if they're both held by the same lender, then you wouldn't expect to see these, these frictions because there's no, there's no conflict of interest. Uh, and you, they sort of find some evidence of that in the data. Uh, and there's this nice interaction with the conforming loan limit. So overall, I think this is a very... I mean, I, I find the results seem plausible. The, the magnitude seem about right to me. I think the empirical strategy is pretty thoughtful. You can always quibble, but I think overall, I think this is a really, a really nice paper. Um, so a couple of comments. The first one is about magnitude. So, so from a policy perspective, you know, how much do you really think this matters from the perspective of refinancing in the overall mortgage market? Uh, and I would say, you know, I think the answer to that, you know, to be, to be honest, has to be uh, it's relatively modest. Uh, and the reason is because this only applies to a subset of the market, right? So, so really what we're talking about here is, you know, mortgages that have this intermediate CLTV, in their case, between 75 and 95%, uh, and also have a multiple, you know, have a junior lien attached to it, right? So the combination of those two things, if I'm looking at the right number in the paper, it's about 8.3% of the sample are in that, uh, are in that bucket. Um, so if you do kind of a back of the envelope exercise, you say, well, what would happen to overall refinancing rates, um, <clears throat> you know, the volume of, of refis, if all states, these 40 states all switch to equitable sub subrogation, um, so, you know, the treatment effect is about 15%, but then only applies to this 8.3% of the market. Um, and then that's, you know, multiplied by the 75% of mortgages that are in states um, with time priority. And you get, you know, in percentage terms, it would be about 1%. So not one percentage point, but 1%. Uh, so it's not a huge number in terms of the overall market. Um, and, you know, I think that could be made a little bit Obviously, the authors probably don't want to advertise that too much, but that's something maybe could be brought out a little bit in the paper. I don't think of that as a critique per se, in the sense that I think the results, firstly, it's, it's, they're just interesting in and of themselves. Uh, and I think you learn some more general things about, um, about refinancing, about household finance from the results, particularly the heterogeneity and some of the other aspects of the results. So I think there's a lot to like about this paper, but, but in terms of you know, what's the policy prescription, you know, one way or another, this is not going to affect aggregate refinancing behavior that much, at least by my reading. 
Um, the second comment is, you know, there's sort of this really interesting work at the end of the paper, which is sort of effectively trying to estimate the payment size elasticity of default, right, using, this, using these refinancings. And so a selling point for this paper, which would apply independent of, uh, you know, the aggregate effects here, uh, is that they have sort of, a, you know, a pretty plausible instrument here for the ease of refinancing. Um, and what they find is using that instrument that, you know, refinancing reduces mortgage default. So, uh, again, sort of sucking up to our, our session chair, um, you know, one, thing that would be, one thing that would be nice would be for the authors to kind of explicitly make contact with, I mean, it's not just Paul's paper, but there's a bunch of papers out there now that are effectively using, uh, you know, interest rate resets on adjustable rate mortgages to try and estimate this elasticity. Uh, and I think what we want to think about, once you have a bunch of papers out there, it's really interesting to sort of look at the variation in the estimates across different settings and across different, uh, you know, diff different types of uh, natural experiments and see how they compare. Um, so, for example, you know, this, so Paul's paper, I think, is finding, if I'm reading it correctly, is finding an elasticity of about one. So a 50% decline in the payment reduces default by 55%. And I think the interesting question here is, would you find the same answer in this setting? So I think the key, you know, one key difference conceptually between the two resets is that the FRM interest rate reset is a permanent shift, right? So you know that that's the upper bound of what you're going to pay in the future. Whereas the ARM reset size, uh, you know, if you don't refinance, if you just keep holding the loan, uh, you, it's an adjustable rate mortgage, so the rate could continue to move around over time. And so to the extent that there's some precautionary behavior going on here, you might expect some differences between the, the magnitude of the, uh, of the payment size elasticity. So it would be interesting to look at that. Um, and I think you could also do a lot more in terms of looking at heterogeneity, in terms of what, you know, is this elasticity larger for certain types of borrowers and so forth. And really, this could be a whole other paper in some way. So right now it's kind of stuffed at the back of this paper, but in a way, you could write a whole paper on that stuff. Um, so I think that would be very interesting. Uh, I want to make two other comments. Um, the first one is that there is now in a sort of an official match, can, you know, the LPS or Black Knight now, and Equifax have now directly matched the LPS mortgages to credit re report data. Um, so, I w you know, if you're writing this paper today, I think it's, you know, and that's available in the Federal Reserve System. So, you know, if you're writing this paper today, I think you would use that rather than use this, this fuzzy match. Uh, it would allow a longer sample period, it's less noisy and so forth. So, maybe the authors don't you know, want to go back and have to re-estimate everything using that alternative data zone from it, they don't. Um, but, but, you know, that's something you, ideally you would, you would do. <laughs> Uh, and then the, the, the final comment I want to make here is something about welfare effects. So really this paper, what it's showing is, you know, in a nutshell, you make refinancing more difficult, refinancing goes down, right? And then what they find also is that gets priced, right? So the ex ante, and what, if you take the results of face value, that you know, people know, and there's a lot of other evidence in other settings, that when you make refinancing more difficult, then, the, the, you know, lenders are happy to give you a slightly lower rate because they know that it's going to be more, you know, it's, the, the value of the refinancing option is, is reduced. Uh, so that all is very natural, but the question, ultimately the question you care about as a policymaker is, you know, what are the welfare effects here? Which of these is better from a welfare point of view? You know, holding these things together, I think you need a model to do that. Um, one way to think about this um, is to sort of think about, you know, what are the states of nature in which you're impeding refinancing? And it's really states of nature when uh, how home prices have fallen, you know, this is speaking more generally about refinancing frictions, uh, situations where home prices have fallen, uh, where aggregate demand externalities might be large, uh, and that would be an argument that you know this kind of contract design, where, where refinancing is difficult in these states of nature, would actually is actually sort of uh, you know a worse contract from a welfare point of view. Uh, and then the final question is the sort of this regulatory question. Uh, you know, do regulatory factors encourage excessive multiple liens? So this is kind of thing that you know Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac require you to uh, get PMI if you take out a loan with an LTV above 80%. So a common thing is you take the GSE loan up to 80% and then take a second lien. Um, and does that, in some sense, the fact that this, this limit is based on LTV rather than CLTV, does that somehow, you know, are we, are we sort of encouraging multiple liens in a way that might be inefficient? Um, but broader takeaway, um, maybe mortgage refinancing sometimes could be, could be a little bit more streamlined than it is. Okay, thanks. I'm loud. Uh, we're running a little up behind schedule, but we can take a question or two. Oh, if, uh, 
call. I'll just make a comment on James' uh, discussion. Um, I'm not, you know, maybe may, maybe you have a point about maybe how Ronell went about motivating it, you know, because it invites comments like that about uh, the scope of the problem. But you know, even one percent, if you're one, if you're the one out of a hundred people who couldn't refinance just because politicians can't get around to passing some law. I mean, I think that's significant. And if you add that in with other frictions in the mortgage market, that could probably be corrected or mitigated by sensible rethinking of the legal environment, whether it has to do with appraisals or title insurance or whatever, property taxes, you know. You know, I think uh, I think it's starting down the right path, at least, you know, thinking about how we might improve the legal environment. So maybe that's a better way to couch it if you if you want to convince people like James that it's a significant paper. Just to add a line to what Paul is just saying, this might be an explanation for why HARP has had difficulties. So perhaps you can tie it to the HARP literature. Yeah, anyway, the HARP treatment of second liens is a bit more complicated, so I didn't want to get into that. Um, I think there are people getting something they know about that than I could say. Yeah, I'll just take this opportunity um, to thank, I think, an important thing. I'll just one thing, which is that uh, that uh, it's true it's only 1%, but the, we argue in the paper that these might be the the risky 1%, right? These are the, the many of the people that don't have second liens and have low CLTV, which is the maybe the bulk of the population actually have uh, quite low default risk. And so you might actually be, they might have disproportionate weight in how worried you are about them. But I'll leave it at that. So our second speaker uh, is Rob Sarama, who's going to talk about the end of the line behavior of credit constrained HELOC. Okay, thank you, Jalapa, and, and the uh, the other organizers of the uh, the conference for having us. Um, the the typical disclaimer applies. These are my opinions, and, and no one else's necessarily. Um, so uh, as a percentage of assets, home equity uh, uh, loans and lines of credit grew uh, significantly between 2002 and, and 2006, 2007. Um, and that's significant um, given some of the information that, uh, that Onasim uh, explained to us earlier about how these home equity lines of credit are structured. So home equity lines of credit um, uh, typically have a draw period during which you have an open line of credit. The, the, during that time period, those are often uh, interest only. Um, and after that draw period ends, uh, it becomes an amortizing loan. Uh, the amortization period can range anywhere from one month to, to, to you know, 20, 30, 30 years. And so the reason why uh, this growth in the home equity um, you know, share of bank assets uh, is, is something that we as supervisors care about uh, is because a lot of these home equity lines of credit had actually 10-year draw periods. Um, so they didn't have really staggered draw periods, but they had somewhat concentrated draw periods. And so therefore, we would expect to see uh, a lot of recasts in this particular product in a relatively concentrated time period. Um, and something like um, nearly 60% of outstanding HELOCs uh, will reach uh, the end of their draw period in the next, over the course of the next four or five years. Um, so, so as supervisors, we care about this. We want to size this. We want to understand what this means for bank capital and, uh, um, and those sorts of things. But we also care about this for, for, for other reasons. Um, so this, uh, this payment increase uh, that's associated with end of draw represents some, some of an exogenous payment increase uh, for this particular product, which can help us get at you know, questions that um, have traditionally been a little bit difficult to answer uh, in the literature around um, what, what happens to, uh, you know, borrower default behavior um, when they're uh, facing a, uh, you know, an upward increase in payments. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a long literature uh, going back that, you know, emphasizes a role for both payment size and for uh, negative equity in mortgage default. Um, and there's, uh, you know, so I, I'll, I'll continue the trend of kissing up to the, uh, <laughs> to the chair. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's some recent papers that, um, 
you know, have looked at, including one by um, Andreas Fuster and, and, and Paul, you know, I think one by Joe Tracy and, and Joshua Wright that's going to be presented tomorrow, um, that look at the effect that payment reductions have on, on lowering default rates. And I think those are really motivated by thinking, thinking about you know, uh, mortgage modification programs and, you know, and, and, and what sort of uh, payment reductions, uh, you know, how payment reductions could potentially affect outcomes uh, in, in that context. Um, I think there's, a, there's another line of the literature, which I think I've heard, I don't see Karen Pence here, but I've heard Karen Pence you know, use this term, which is the, uh, the people and products debate, um, which is, you know, the, the fundamental question is, was it, was it complicated financial products that really drove the crisis? Were there just these products that were just inherently toxic? Um, or was it some combination of, you know, the products and the people who sort of were placed, or the, you know, the borrowers who were placed in those products um, that led to, to you know, um, uh, you know, the, a lot of the, you know, uh, uptick in defaults during the crisis. And indeed, Karen has, has a paper, uh, Mayor Pence and Sherilyn, where they, they observed that um, while, you know, some of these more complicated products like option arms, um, you know, were indeed a feature of the crisis when they actually looked at the data. They were, you know, those, those uh, sort of the more subprime borrowers were also concentrated in those products. Um, and so it's not clear that it's the product alone that's, that, that's driving this. And so this question of whether, um, you know, it's, it's sort of the product or the borrowers that are placed into the product is something that we might care about when we're thinking about, you know, mortgage design and some of the questions actually that are going to be discussed tomorrow. Um, so in this paper, we just ask, how do payment changes associated with HELOC recast affect the default behavior of uh, borrowers with different types of credit characteristics? So if we take pools of borrowers with different types of credit characteristics, do they react differently to this, um, what we think is an exogenous payment increase? Um, and we use a fairly straightforward uh, methodology where we're really just looking at cumulative default rates around the time of the end of draw. And I'll go into that in more detail over the next couple slides, but I want to go ahead and, and uh, I think we should go ahead and just take a look at the data. Um, so this first plot, um, we're plotting two different things in these plots. Um, the, the dotted line is showing uh, a set of loans that are not reaching end of draw during this time period. And the gray line is plotting uh, loans that are reaching end of draw. And here I've just shown two different cuts. So uh, the gray line in the top part is, is plotting the uh, cumulative default rate and cumulative payoff rate for loans reaching the end of draw in February of 2013, um, and the bottom is just the April the April cut of that. Um, and so and we're you know so we're calculating the end of draw rate in these plots starting at the you know at the period in which uh, the draw period ends. Um, and so the so you can see we kind of see what we would expect here. We see the sharp you know rise in, 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 in cumulative defaults for the loans reaching end of draw. But the problem with this sort of a, a, a picture and calculating cumulative default rates in this way is that there could be selection effects that are driving this larger um, uh, cumulative default rate that we're seeing on the, on the left-hand side of this plot. So the better borrowers, perhaps, could simply be paying off their, or, um, either rolling over their HELOCs or, or paying off the HELOCs before the, the loan reaches the end of draw thereby making the, the sample of borrowers that we observe at the end of draw just an inherently worse, worse sample. Um, so, 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 that's, so, so here we might have a, a treatment and a sample selection effect kind of commingled. Um, so one way to, that we, you know, we think you can get around this is by simply uh, starting to calculate your cumulative default curves at a point in time that's early enough to where we think that all of the attrition associated with this event, this end of draw, this payment increase, um, would be sort of captured within the time window. Uh, and so that's, so what we've done here is we've just calculated uh, cumulative default rates for the same two pools of loans um, over uh, starting uh, 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 four or five months before the end of draw. Um, and what's striking here actually is now you look at the, you compare this plot to the plot on the, on the last uh, slide, and now we see that the loans that aren't reaching end of draw actually have a higher cumulative default rate over this time period than the loans that are reaching end of draw. And that's, that was surprising to us when, when we saw that. Um, but when you think about it, the set of loans that uh, I mentioned earlier that, you know, a lot of these uh, loans that are reaching end of draw have these 10-year draw periods. So if you think about 
um, what types of loans we're seeing in these two different sets. Well, the loans that are reaching end of draw were predominantly originated in 2003, where the, whereas the loans that are not reaching end of draw were originated in subsequent years, some of the years where we were seeing peak house prices. Um, and so if you actually just take a look at this, some sample statistics, I know it's late, we don't want to look at you know, maybe tables like this, um, but if you look at the sample statistics, that's what's reflected. Um, we see that you know, the loans that are reaching end of draw um, were, were you know, originated in later vintages, those later, you know, those later vintages, um, we've seen bigger sort of declines in house prices since the origination, which implies higher CLTVs. Um, those, 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 from those vintages, we also saw larger increases in the unemployment rate uh, from the time of origination. And so the issue here is that we're actually not, these are not comparable cohorts that we're comparing here. They're actually cohorts that have two different really fundamental observable credit characteristics. And so we need a way to uh, control for those credit characteristics um, so that we can see, you know, to try to sort of back out the, the actual effect that's associated with this, this end of draw. We can't just simply take the difference between the two curves in this picture to get a sense of what that is. Um, and so what we do is we build a fairly simple um, competing hazard model that includes kind of all the usual things you would expect. Um, we've got some variables to capture payoff incentive. We've got uh, variables to capture strategic default incentive, and then other factors uh, like you know, credit, credit bureau scores um, that might affect uh, the default rate. Um, and we use that. So, so here I just plotted this, uh, you know, the, the out of sample fit of the model, and this is generally what we would like to see. We'd like to see a model that has a reasonably good out of sample fit, meaning that you know, for the overall population of of HELOCs, the, 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 the predictions of this model are generally unbiased. And so if we take that back to the pictures I was showing you a moment ago, um, the way we can sort of relate that back, and just this is a very you know, simple way of, of constructing this, but it's just to simply take the cumulative default rates that we were plotting in, in these previous pictures and subtract out the model predicted cumulative default rates to get what we're calling sort of the the end of draw effect, or the proportion of the cumulative default rate that's associated with things not explained by our model, um, and you know some of the assumptions that we're making here is that the assumption I alluded to earlier is that all of the prediction errors you know calculated over the time period, so that these these prediction errors or um, these cumulative default rates are calculated over a time period that includes all attrition associated with end of draw. Um, so if we're missing some in the, in the early part, we're going to miss, um, you know, me mismeasure this effect. Um, and we need the prediction errors to be um, unbiased. So we need this model to have an unbiased uh, prediction area, error for the loans that are not reaching end of draw. Um, and so these plots uh, simply do that calculation. It takes the plots, the cumulative default curves that I plotted a couple slides ago and subtracts off the cumulative default Predict, you know, the predicted cumulative default curves that got stem out of this model. And again, the dotted line is the set of loans not reaching end of draw. And you notice that this kind of fluctuates around zero. And all that's, all that's reflecting is, is this. It's just reflecting that for the loans not reaching end of draw, uh, the model error is, 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 is relatively small. Um, whereas for the loans that are reaching end of draw, the, the gray line, we now see um, this sharp um, sort of ramp up in default rates a few months after reaching end of draw. And this is associated with our definition of end of, uh, of, of default, which is just 90 days past due, which is why you see sort of the ramp, ramp up a few months later. Something important, going back to the selection bias um, um, uh, comment I made earlier, um, is that you see actually on the cumulative payoff curves that the, uh, the model errors here start to diverge a few months before end of draw. So indeed, we think that there is some um, impetus to pay off the loans that's, uh, that's, that's, that's being triggered by this end of draw um, based on what, what we're seeing in, in the data. Um, so now what we do is we just pull together all HELOCs that were reaching end of draw between February of 2013 and June of 2013. And we, we sort of do, do the same exercise. So we... we compute um, the, the empirical cumulative default rate, we compute the predicted cumulative default rate, and we subtract the predicted from the, from the empirical, and we get some curves. And um, so, uh, so what these curves show is that over this you know, 12, 13 month period, starting four months before end of draw and going 
um, six or seven months after end of draw, um, we see that you know the cumulative default rate um, associated with uh, the associated with things not explained by our model is about 1.5 percent. Um, and the cumulative payoff rate is in the is in the 25 to 30 30 percent range, um, and so that's for the entire group of loans. But as I mentioned earlier, what we really want to get at here is how do these payment increases affect borrowers of different with different credit characteristics? Um, and so what we've done here is we've kind of just sort of separated out borrowers into and uh, separated out HELOCs into two different sets. Uh, one being what we're calling the the relatively low quality set. And these would, have, would be the HELOCs with an origination FICO score below 725 and a CLTV above 80%. Um, and then the relatively high, and those are characterized by the, uh, by the blue dash line in the, uh, in the pictures. Um, and the relatively high quality set, which are characterized by the green dash line in the picture, are just the HELOCs that um, have an origination FICO above 725 and CLTV below 80. And what you can see here is that the what, or what we, what we see in the data is that the end of draw effect for the lower credit quality borrowers is indeed significantly higher for the low credit quality um, HELOCs than for the high credit quality HELOCs, you know, of the order of a little over, in, the, you know, in this um, picture, a little over 3%. And, and what you see when you look at the, at the CPR, and perhaps we can't really say what's going on here uh, in terms of um, what, what's happening to these HELOCs after they leave our sample, um, but the payoff rates are significantly higher for the for the bar the higher credit quality borrowers who are yeah who may have an easier time sort of accessing credit markets and rolling the HELOCs over into into new lines. Um, so finally, we want to get at sort of this question of what's the role of the payment change, um, you know, for these different types of borrowers. So we have a payment increase. Does that the payment increase affect all borrowers kind of the same, or does it affect borrowers differently? Um, and so on the left-hand side, we have uh, small payment changes, which are, are less than 200 percent. So it's, it's not, maybe it doesn't seem that small. Um, and then we have in the middle, these are the non-balloon large payments. So these are any large payments above 200 percent, but non-balloon payments, meaning that the, pay, the uh, amortization period is greater than three months. So we define uh, am, you know, am, any amortization period that's uh, three months or less um, as being a balloon payment HELOC. And then on the far right, we just plot the balloon payment HELOC uh, end of draw effects. And, and what we see is, um, you know, generally, uh, the, you know, for the, for the relatively large payment changes, for the higher credit quality borrowers, we don't see uh, a huge increase in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the end of draw effect. So this green line is relatively flat in the middle picture. Um, but for the higher credit quality bars, and I apologize for the, uh, it's really hard to see, uh, uh, even if it weren't five o'clock, it would still be hard to see these. Um, but it's, uh, for five, you know, it's about, um, the, you know, the large payment changes for the, um, for the lower credit quality HELOCs is about, uh, 5%, uh, default rate above what our model would predict. And then for the balloon payments, we see just substantially higher default rates, um, um, for both the, for both the low, uh, credit quality borrowers and the high credit quality borrowers, but we see a significant separation between the high credit quality borrowers and the low credit quality borrowers. With the high credit quality borrowers with balloon payments, um, their um, you know our calculated end of draw effect for them over this time period is about five percent, whereas for the for the uh, lower credit quality borrowers, it's pushing pushing twenty percent. Um, so we you know we just I, and I, I'm, I'm under a minute right now. Um, and Rocco's on Rome time, so uh, <laughs> we need to clear clear the clear the podium. Um, but we did do um, so. We, you know, we we wanted to see if you know are, are these like differences in the lines that I just showed you statistically significant? We did some bootstrap um, analysis to, and you know, and and, and uh, you can look at that in the paper if, if you so desire. Um, and I will mention that we are um, in the process of pushing out a new version of this paper that addresses some of the feedback that actually a lot of people in the room have given us over the last year on this paper. Um, and, and one, it enabled, we use a longer period around the end of draw, which, which kind of gives us a little bit of robustness around this possibility that some of the attrition is happening before the end of the draw, you know, before the, the period in which we're calculating the cumulative default rate. Um, 
we reduced, so in this, we, we did this fuzzy match between CoreLogic and the Y14 data in, in the analysis I just showed you, and what we're doing is we're just, we're strictly using the Y14 data in, in the new version of the paper to, to try to sort of uh, eliminate that. And then we're trying to eliminate the importance of the model that we specified. Um, and we're doing that in two ways. One, we're sort of formally doing like a dip, more of a difference in difference approach where we take sort of the difference between the CDR, the cumulative CDR and the predicted CDR minus the different for, for end of draw loans, minus the difference for non-end of draw loans. And then the other thing we're doing is just focusing on the 2003 cohort. So a lot of the effects that I mentioned that were driving you know, some of the differences in the plots um, I showed earlier were, were cohort type effects associated with different, different house price paths since origination. Um, and so one way we can get around that a bit is by looking at a single uh, vintage. Um, so that's, that's all I have. Um, thank you for your time. And if you have any feedback, please send it to us. Good idea. Um, I was just wondering if those effects you're seeing were, uh, in absolute terms, larger. But if you were to think about a risk multiplier uh, or a log probability model, whether or not they'd actually be a constant across the different loan type, the, the categories. Yeah, no, they're they're not. But they're not. You can't translate these in in that way. Um, we'd, we'd have to do a, but a different difference difference model if you've got you know if you're estimating a hazard you might have something closer to multipliers you could look at right just sort of like a shift in the baseline in the baseline hazard yeah and I, and I think that's the that's the one of the issues that we're getting at is sort of how it interacts with some of the underlying other other characteristics that are shift, would be shifting the hazard function and, and how you would get at that in a hazard model All right, thanks. Uh, sorry for the time uh, that we still um, um, getting the PowerPoint ready. Uh, I just want to do a better job to put more uh, useful comments, so uh, good effort. Uh, first of all, my name is Min Chi, uh, OCC Credit Risk Analysis. I'm really, really pleased to read this paper because I'm personally very interested in this paper, and I also have a research project underway that addresses exactly the same issue. Uh, so, so to me, when Jalapa invited me to, to discuss paper, without hesitation, I picked this paper out of all the other wonderful papers. Uh, so basically, um, as you already uh, hear, um, Rob did a great job uh, presenting the paper. It's very clear, be very clear uh, in terms of setting up the, the, the issue and then motivate the paper and very well execute it. So just to, for people who are not really that familiar with the paper, I want to have a very quick highlight about that, what they have done. Uh, so basically, uh, the paper tried to address a very, very important question for supervisors, for you know, bank regulators, whether the increase in required payments at the end of the draw uh, of the HELOCs will affect the default rates. So that, to us, is a very uh, important question. It's a really billion dollar question that we, we try to say um, uh, in this regard. So it's a very important question. And their approach is they estimate a competing hazard model of default and payoff uh, for the HELOCs with the data that includes no information on end of the draw. Uh, and use the model to predict out a sample around the end of the draw. Um, so that's uh, the model is based on. And they also uh, did a lot of tests uh, to test uh, the model error, to measure the model error error on the testing sample and also on the control sample, and also try to find out what are the missing uh, factors that could explain the model error. So that's their approach. Uh, and their finding is that you know on the uh, control sample, uh, for loans that didn't go through the end of draw period, uh, the model error seems to be uh, not very significant, close to zero. Uh, however, for the, uh, the loans that uh, going through the end of draw, uh, the model underestimate the default risk. Uh, and also, there are differences among the different pockets of these uh, loans that going through the uh, end of draw effect, uh, the lower credit quality one, and also the ones with, uh, you know, uh, bigger payment shock, including the balloon payments, are the ones that uh, is the most problematic. So, so by looking at this, uh, I think um, 
the paper makes a lot of uh, intuitive uh, understanding. I just want to highlight uh, a few things in the paper, uh, the strength of the paper, so that we you know, could appreciate their work more. Uh, also, towards the end, I would like to point out some of the limitation that may help uh, them improve. Uh, on the strength of the paper, uh, this is a really timely and important topic, as we see that you know, there are over $500 billion outstanding uh, line credit that's out there. And a lot of them, as you can see in this chart, uh, a lot of them are originated uh, in the early 2000s. Um, so the green line here uh, is the, uh, the origination um, year, uh, the volume uh, around which uh, year the, uh, the loans were originated. So a bulk of them actually originated throughout uh, early 2000. Uh, the peak is around 2005-ish, 2006-ish. Uh, pretty much close to the crash uh, of the market. So, so you can ask questions about the, the quality of these loans originated during those period of time. Um, and by the way, this data is OCC data, uh, OCC home equity loan level data. Um, so as you can see, the origination peaks um, in that green line. Um, oops. Does the pointer work? Okay, anyway, you, you can just uh, look at the green line. The peak is uh, around uh, 2005, 6-ish. And then um, I would also like to draw your attention to the blue line. The blue line is where we show the, uh, the end of draw uh, uh, volume. So as you can see, the blue line, the end of draw peak will uh, occur around like 2000, maybe uh, seven, eight-ish, um, 2006, 2005, six. So there's a lot of loans that will uh, get into the end of the draw. And then you can also see the maturity. The line, the red line is the maturity of the distribution of maturity. So you can see there's a big gap between the blue line and the red line. What does that mean? Um, well, these reach the end of the draw, but they're not mature yet. Uh, so then the big question is for that gap over there, uh, what kind of behavior to these loans that, you know, uh, approach the maturity and then the end of draw is, is near. And for the ones that will mature later in 2035-ish, uh, uh, we still have a lot of time, but the, the actual end of draw is pretty much uh, peaked around 2000 in the next two or three years. So there is a lot of um, uncertainty what happened to this loan. So it's a really timely, important topic. And, uh, and their paper actually finished last year, so they are even more forefront in terms of you know, anticipating the importance of the topic. So now, uh, focus on other strengths. Um, they uh, obviously have very creative way to overcoming the major data limitation, because the da core logic data they used didn't have allow them to identify end of the draw. And in fact, I also look at that data, try to use the data to, to, you know, to build my model. I just shake my hands and say, no, I cannot <laughs> rely on that data for that purpose, because I cannot find useful uh, uh, information on when the long uh, end of draw approaches. Um, so they are very creative in terms of using that data, uh, leverages long history, but also focus on uh, testing on the, uh, the Y14 data. And they also consider the payment shock treatment effect and also you know, very skillfully control for the selection bias in terms of credit quality and um, negative equity. And their findings are not very surprising. It's consistent with the literature, uh, consistent with uh, other empiric findings, and the paper is well written and pleasure to read. So here come to the limitation part. Um, their strength is also part of their limitation because the data limitation that the model build is based on limited information set. Uh, and then um, the data uh, contains information, uh, the, the, um, the, the Y14 data didn't start until 2012, so that's uh, the, the challenge you're facing. Uh, and also another thing, just within the scope, where I also say um, their model includes some of the useful drivers, the usual suspect, like the origination FICO, uh, updated loan to value, uh, origination, um, you know, vintage and state dummy, but there are also a lot of other variables that are typically uh, cited in the literature and found significant are not included there about the loan, about the property, and about the uh, obligor, and also some of the commonly used macro factors are not there, for example, HPI, GDP growth. And in terms of loan uh, documentation type, you know, whether it's interest only balloon, and whether it's a retail or wholesale originating channel of the home equity did not uh, put in there. And also there's no utilization rate. Uh, we know for home equity utilization rate actually measure the um, credit constraints, so it's also useful. Uh, whether the property is owner occupancy and you know the type and price. So there is, um, I also refresh FICO. That's a very useful uh, risk driver. I know 
because of data limitation, they may not be able to, uh, to do that in core logic and also uh, data income. So these are the important variables that typically find very useful. Uh, unfortunately, they are not made it to uh, their um, you know, computing uh, risk hazard model. So then the big question is, uh, because of meeting of these variables uh, towards the end when they do the you know, model error analysis uh, with the impact on the, the payment shock and also credit quality overstated, uh, you know, relative to the, um, the, the control population. So that is a question and answer in this paper. And also other things um, that I wish the put paper could discuss, but they didn't, is how they uh, use the Y14 to identify the end of draw uh, in core logic, you know, based on what fuzzy logic. So there's no description of, uh, of the fuzzy logic uh, and also whether the results will be sensitive to uh, the matching methods. And uh, also the paper perhaps falls short uh, to discuss uh, implication for risk management, bank supervision, and policy. Uh, so that's something may, you know, as regulators, I would interesting to see. So here, got, get, getting down one minute left uh, to talk about the, uh, the impact of these um, omitted variables, right? So what is the potential impact of other omitted variables of, uh, in addition to, you know, um, the variable they already included? Uh, and also, um, I... As a regulator, I'm also interested in uh, things related to directly related to payment shock, utilization rate, and also the time since end of the draw. These are the things I actually, in my uh, paper, I uh, focus on these uh, three variables in addition to other control variables. So to give you a little bit of uh, general idea, um, the ballpark about the impact of other variables. Uh, so this one is their, um, their paper um, in their computing hazard model. Uh, they have R square about point oh, uh, pseudo R square about 0.06 uh, something. Um, and then their sample is small. It's core logic data. We understand the limitation. Uh, observation is around, um, I think it's about 3 million observation in their model. Uh, so you, using our data, we have observation about uh, 7 million. Uh, about those 7 million loans in uh, those is the data, about uh, 0.5 million. Uh, have the end of draw information. So we have a lot, a bigger sample, a sample with a longer history. Uh, also, we have actually five years data, performance data to, uh, to build a model. So it's a much uh, richer uh, data set to do that. And so here, uh, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't show here, but these are different sample specifications we tried, uh, including the first one um, right next to the original paper is the um, using their variables but on our data. So it, you kind of get a ballpark comparison. So the blue line is the pseudo R square. Uh, the red line is the accuracy ratio. Um, and then uh, each step of the way, we add in um, more variables um, using um, you know, payment shock, utilization uh, included, and also other uh, emitted variables they have in there. So one thing you do notice, um, there are some variation um, that captures uh, the, uh, the variable of the additional emitted variables that we add in gradually. Uh, they do uh, seem to improve the explanatory power, and they also uh, tend to have a higher accuracy ratio. And we also model uh, at different horizons, uh, one month horizon, one year horizon. So the information here from looking at the slides is maybe the, uh, some of the emitted variables uh, um, may point into the direction of the model arrow towards maybe overstate some of the impact on the payment or around the end of the draw. Uh, there may be other factors uh, that also perhaps can explain the model error but was not somehow included into the model. So, but overall, um, I really enjoy the paper. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a paper that addresses very important topic and also very creative utilize the data uh, to answer a very important question. Thank you. We'll take one question. Larry. Okay, thanks. Um, first of all, I, you know, one of the things I mean, that they used was, uh, was they used the core logic data, which had the advantage of sort of having, having the full data back in the period when all this origination activity was going on. And the thing that really impressed me about this database is that when you look at the results, they look really strong. You know, when you look at, you know, what you expect is, you know, borrowers that, you know, borrowers with low FICO score, I mean, borrowers with like underwater properties have more difficulty refinancing and all. In fact, it looks so good that I'm one, I'm starting to question the Y14M data because, you know, uh, you didn't, you don't really have the true end of draw. You just have the 10 year period. And so you just assume 10 years. Well, at 10 years, you see all this activity happening, which is very consistent with a 
10-year ended drop. But if you look at the Y14M data, the data seems to be kind of more all, all you know over the place. You know, they they don't necessarily you know all of them aren't 10 years. They have these other terms, and that's what makes me think wondering if maybe this 10-year term is actually a pretty good variable, and maybe the banks might not be reporting it as well as we like in the uh, you know in the uh, in the 14M data. So I'm wondering if you've had a chance to look at the 14M data with your model and and what kind of things you're trying to like, like what Min was suggesting. Yeah. So I think I mean I think I think to that comment and to and to Min's comment, I think these are some of the things that we've been thinking about, which is a how do we reduce our reliance on this fuzzy match between the Y14 and uh, and CoreLogic, and and we've simply done that actually by just in the new version of the paper, just using Y14 data, applying the model to the Y14 data, and in the Y14 data we have the the. Um, the benefit of being able to see exactly which loans are reaching end of draw versus which loans are not. So we get a much cleaner sort of separation between those two groups. The second thing that I think, you know, Min, thank, and thank you for your comments, um, that, um, you know, that you're getting at that we, um, we you know, we uh, make great efforts to do was to reduce the reliance on our model choices. So we don't want our model choices to drive um, th to drive this effect, and we, we've done that in, in really two ways. One is by using the difference in difference approach, and the second way is um, is actually by 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 sort of focusing on a single vintage, mm -hmm. um, which the vintage for which we actually have a lot of data on re loans reaching end of draw at this point in time. Um, I think a lot of my comments maybe really help you to address referee's concern, but really to us, no matter how you look at it, um, the effects are there. Uh, like in my own study, I use competing hazard model, I use uh, Heckman selection, uh, I use you know logic pro probit, different horizons. No matter how I look at it, the payment effect, the end of draw effect, also the liquidity shock effect, they're always there, and also they tend to be consistent. So. So, so my suggestion here is really just to, to, to make your, you know, the paper stand strong against, you know, referee's criticism, but I, I believe the story is there. <laughs> okay. So we're running out of time. And um, so we're going to go to the last paper, which was originally the first paper. So if you're not paying attention and you think it's now, and you're inverting this and you think it's 145, uh, the drinks are in 25 minutes. Uh, so our last paper is Rock, Rocco, that's a good name uh, for the last paper, Rocco Cicciaretti, who will talk about the determinants of households bank switching, which obviously has nothing to do with second liens. <laughs> okay, thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to the conference. Uh, this is a joint paper with Marianna Brunetti from Tor Vergata and Lyubica Georgievich from SAFE that is also attending the conference. And um, I will try to shrink the road plan, so maybe uh, skipping the literature review because I don't have any paper from the chair to quote. And uh, <laughs> let me go straight to, the, to our research question. Uh, we are... Um, what we uh, want to address with this paper is that uh, today we face a situation where the household is, uh, uh, is linked to bank K, and uh, we want to understand why tomorrow we can face a possible situation where the household is linked to bank B. So uh, we call this uh, movement from bank K to bank B uh, switching. And we have also uh, several uh, definitions of switching. So the idea of this uh, paper, so the motivation, is uh, coming from the micro, uh, micro idea that uh, if you look at the Ernest & Young survey on, on uh, global consumer banking survey, uh, they said that uh, in 2012, there were 12% of uh, customers that were planning to change bank at world level. So this is a huge number, 12% of uh, Customer. Uh, what happened is uh, that um, in our database that is focusing on uh, Italian data, uh, this uh, share of 12% tw uh, reaches 20% in uh, two years, so in 2011 and 2012. This, because the survey is uh, biannual, uh, this is the number that on average in our uh, time span, people actually in Italy change their banking. So this is the real. Uh, number is not what they willing to do. On the macro uh, point of view, uh, this changing of uh, banks by household 
uh, reflect on uh, stable and unstable uh, deposit from the uh, bank capital requirement. So when you change bank, uh, you take your deposit and you move to another bank. So this is a possible uh, instability of uh, bank's liability. And uh, according to the BIS, they imagine that there is a, a 5% uh, of runoff factor. But actually, we, we saw on the data that this number is uh, bigger. So the idea is that um, what we want to investigate is the household bank relationship that is not investigated so far, and uh, what are the implications for household and bank. So from household point of view, when you uh, use a bank, is a, is a assumption it costs me, and uh, you want to minimize this cost. From the bank point of view, this affects the liability side because deposit can be uh, moved to another bank, and so there is uh, the problem of stability of funds from a uh, bank point of view. So our idea is that uh, we believe that uh, there are uh, different determinants, and we define these determinants in um, three categories. The first one is the peculiarity of the outsold bank relationship. And then we control also for bank characteristics, household characteristics, and what we call background characteristics. Uh, the contribution of our paper is that uh, using uh, a, a survey from Bank of Italy on household income and wealth, uh, we were able, uh, thanks to the, uh, to, bank, to the Bank of Italy, to match with uh, data at bank level. So we are able to, uh, to provide a, to provide uh, for a population representative sample uh, a direct link between household and bank. So what we, sh what we were able to show is that, just to kind of summarize uh, what are the results, is that household bank relationship matters in terms of exclusivity, meaning how many banks the household use, in terms of intensity, how many services household use for that particular bank, and the scope of the relationship, which services is used. Then we were also, uh, we controlled for uh, household characteristics and uh, we um, surprisingly saw that economic condition does not play a role while there is uh, um, an effect on education and financial literacy, even if these effects are, uh, they have opposite sign. And, and finally, we also, show that bank characteristics, uh, for example, cooperative banks are less uh, frequent to be changed, while listed banks are more frequent to be changed. And to be fair with the, the discussion, we uh, were able to add also um, that a more competitive market, in a few days, <laughs> more competitive market increased the probability to switch. This is a new result, so uh, I apologize, but we have this in a, few days ago. So these are uh, what we want, what, what I will show you. And uh, as I said, um, also because uh, it's very, uh, we are very late, we take, uh, let me say just that we take uh, references from the bank uh, from the literature using deposit, unique bank relationship and dynamics of uh, consumer relationship. Then we also take um, references from uh, household finance. And we, um, we took, uh, using the, um, the paper of Campbell 2006, that uh, one of the mistakes made by household is to uh, fail to refinance the mortgage. So we try to explain what happened in, uh, in, the, in the Italian market. And also we took also reference from consumption, payment, insurance, and portfolio choices. Uh, there are a few papers uh, related to our, uh, directly to our uh, analysis. And two papers are from Brown and Adder, and Brown and Altman, and one is from, from uh, Kieser. They uh, show similar uh, results, but uh, in a different way. So the uh, peculiarity of our paper is that we were able to timely trace the also decision to switch uh, or stay with the same bank. And uh, our data are uh, population representative. So the estimation model is, uh, a profit model uh, where we have uh, our dependent variable is a binary variable taking one if 
also change bank between one observation and the other. So we took the survey at time t, look which bank they have. We took survey at time t plus one, and we see if the bank is different, then the variable take uh, value one. And then we have our, our uh, household bank relationship variable, and then uh, variable at household level, bank level, and background control. Uh, we also uh, estimate our uh, standard error using um, cluster at household level. And um, the data are um, unbalanced panel with around uh, 3,000 unique household. The time span is between 2006 and 2012. From SHIP, we take all uh, data uh, for household bank relationship, demographic, economic, and background um, variables, and as I, as I said, we took uh, from Bank of Italy, that is, um, is not related to SHIELD, the uh, data on uh, number of ATM or number of branches by province and by bank to build the final index of uh, market competition. From Bensco, we took uh, data at bank level, site, specialization, uh, market status, and performance. So this is our uh, density statistic for the dependent variable. As you can see, the uh, average uh, <coughs> switch is 23% uh, in the full sample. It's divided by uh, waves. In the first wave, we have 31% uh, 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 switch. And in the other waves, we have around 20%. Uh, I will come back to this difference uh, later, because also looking at this density statistic, we end up uh, with a new research uh, topic and that now is a separate paper. So um, about the um, household bank relationship variable, we have uh, exclusivity, 80% uh, of the household uh, have only one bank in the sample. Uh, then we have a uh, long-lasting relationship, number of services, and services divided by uh, types of payment, insurance, mortgage, consumer credit, portfolio management, and uh, the uh, other services. So the, um, the last uh, category is uh, everything that is not included in the, in the previous one. What we did uh, as a... Um, as implementing uh, our idea is that for each of the categories, we define uh, a variable called R and drop if when household move from uh, one bank to another, so from uh, each wave, if they add this service or they drop. So this variable is taking value one if you, from one way to another, include one of these services that was not included in your previous uh, bank relation, and this if you drop between T and T plus one. Um, and also we have uh, household controls, I will not, maybe I will skip this, uh, and bank and background controls. And then also, uh, here are uh, descriptive statistics uh, of the database at uh, bank level, just to show that uh, we have 84 unique, unique banks in our data set. They are representative of the, of the market in terms of um, total assets. And uh, also, they are represented with respect to uh, bank specialization, so commercial, saving, and um, so this is our first um, model uh, result. As I said, uh, exclusivity matters. So if you have uh, one bank relation, uh, you reduce the probability to switch by uh, 9.2 uh, percentage point. These are uh, marginal uh, effect. Then uh, we have that number of total services. So uh, reduce the, uh, the switching. This is a proxy for uh, cost of switching that is already in the, lit in the literature when uh, they talk about relationship between firms and banks. So we confirm also from the household point of view that 
the cost of switching reduce the probability to switch. And then we have our uh, single uh, services uh, that uh, affect the switching in, on a negative side. So we uh, divide the number of, of total services by uh, the type of services. What we did uh, was to implement our add and drop variable. So for the exclusivity, we confirm the negative sign. That is also confirmed for uh, the cost of switching. But when we move to this add and drop uh, variable, you can see that the only uh, service that uh, has a positive sign that goes against the cost of switching is when a household add or drop a mortgage from his uh, basket of services. So when an household is observed at time t with a bank uh, A and move to uh, in t plus one with a bank B, Usually, you can observe that there is a mortgage that is added to the basket of service. And this uh, magnitude is 14.7%. As well as when you drop the, uh, the mortgage, you are uh, willing to change bank by 13.6%. Uh, uh, so the idea is that the only service that uh, drives the change is the mortgage. Uh, when we look at this data, and uh, we saw also that uh, there were, um, oh, sorry. So the main funding is related to um, the idea that household bank relationship uh, matters in terms of intense use of bank services that uh, is, uh, is called already the, cost, the switching cost, and also in terms of mortgages that is associated to uh, uh, the decision of household to, to change the main bank. So um, we also saw that uh, household characteristic matters and uh, education and financial literacy as a reverse sign, uh, but economic condition does not play uh, any role. Then uh, probability of switching is lower for uh, cooperative banks, while it is higher for listed banks. And a more competitive market, even if I didn't show this number were in the table, uh, increased the probability of switching. Uh, what we did was uh, we made uh, some robust uh, check. So for different measure of switching, we create two additional variables. One is called switching new, uh, and the other is called switching drop. We also uh, define different measure for loyalty and different specification for financial literacy. That play a role. And um, referring also to um, what happened between uh, 2006 and 2012, we had a, a change in, in legislation that um, reduced to zero the, um, the refinancing uh, fee uh, for a mortgage. And so we did, uh, we exploited a different uh, estimation showing that the treated group, people that during the uh, sample period uh, as uh, a mortgage before the law was a negative sign, so they were uh, not switching uh, a bank by 15.3%. Then we have uh, a dummy variable post legislation that is positive. And so when we multiply the treated group by the post, we show that the sign became positive, so the treated group that are uh, also that during the sample period as uh, a, a mortgage defined a, a positive sign by 21.3%. And I'm out of time, so oops. I can finish here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming in here and uh, uh, the opportunity to read and discuss this interesting paper. Um, uh, 
If I talk fast, it's uh, because I'm from New York, A, eh? and the, uh, we only have a few minutes until drinks, and Paul uh, promised us, and so, so I know that if I'm the only thing standing between us and the, uh, you and the reception, then I better start talking quickly. So, uh, so even before you load it, um, let me just say I really enjoy this paper. I thought it was really very well done, very interesting. Uh, there's not enough work done in this area. Uh, simply uh, because uh, there isn't uh, this very rich database, which you I'm envious of, very uh, uh, exciting to have. Sorry? Oh, oh okay. Well, <laughs> oh, you're switching around the presentation. <laughs> and um, and also, I can cut my remarks short because I did have comments about uh, about how do I move around this thing, just uh, up and down, uh, just up and down. I'm not going to be doing anything fancy. Okay, great. <laughs> So, um, uh, so I did have comments about the uh, about competition, which I can now uh, uh, skip over. Uh, so um, here are uh, the the conclusions, and I'm not going to go over it again because Rocco did an excellent job. Um, uh, that are basically that um, household banking relationships are built on some sort of familiarity, you know, and uh, the exclusivity, the number of services, um, all of that reduce the likelihood of the search of the switch. And you make a big point about mortgage borrowing, and that really is what I want to talk about. So, you know, this is again a fascinating paper. The results are very robust and reasonable. So I want to just, uh, of course, my job as the discussant is to help you with some of the less obvious results. So I focused on the issue about uh, mortgages and what is this link between mortgages and household switching of banks. Excuse me. So, um, so the interesting thing, and you know, you didn't have time to talk about, it, is that essentially the holding of a mortgage was insignificant in the uh, explanation of the probability of a switch. It was just the change, either the adding or the dropping in the mortgage, that was uh, statistically significant. So what that means, that suggests to me, is that it's not the mortgage business that builds uh, loyalty, perhaps, but it is that essentially banks are explicitly tying the terms of the mortgage to their customers. And essentially, I know that there are many uh, banks uh, throughout the world that have differential rates for their customers and for non-customers. And so it's very likely that it is the mortgage, that uh, the uh, decision that is really just a bundled um, uh, service uh, with other services that the bank is providing. And that is what, you, what you're picking up. So the interesting thing uh, here is that this Bersani degree, decree, uh, which was um, uh, you know, an exogenous, a natural experiment, always great to have a natural experiment, uh, and, so, and that eliminated mortgage prepayment penalties. So it was a shock to the mortgage pricing in Italy. So essentially, it created a disequilibrium situation in my mind. And so what you found for, those, um, for that uh, diff and diff that you did, that all of a sudden now mortgages come in significantly. So it, does that mean that, that you can conclude from that that mortgage lending builds loyalty between a household and their bank? And I don't think that you can. I think that the reason, and you have a figure in the paper, which I didn't reproduce here, um, is that you know, basically you're finding that that effect peters out. It tampers off. So um, uh, after the after the uh, Bersani uh, decree, so in some sense, I, my interpretation of that is that this is, was a disequilibrium shock. It was a, it made the mortgage contracts um, uh, adjust uh, to the new rules as that filtered through the system and as borrowers. Uh, 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 change their behavior, then they were able to recontract. And what you found at the end is really that there is still there is no uh, st statistically significant probability uh, impact of, uh, of the probability on the probability of switching of holding a mortgage. Now remember, of course, that this was also during the crisis period. So writing new mortgages was probably non-existent during this time period. So I'm not sure how much you really have in terms of um, 
of those uh, of those changes. I think you probably got more drops than you got um, additions uh, to that. So I really wanted to understand, and I think you're in the unique position to be able to answer the question, of which services build household loyalty to a main bank. Um, I don't think it's really mortgage services. Your results seem to suggest it's the use of consumer credit and portfolio management services, which seem to be very robust in explaining the, the, the uh, likelihood to switch. So in some sense, that makes a lot of sense. That makes sense to me because those are the informationally rich types of services that the banks provide for their their, um, uh, their customers. And so you might expect that there, if there's private information generated in the course of uh, consumer credit uh, decisions and portfolio management, well, that information would be valuable and would uh, reduce the likelihood of a household switch. Um, the use of payments was also very interesting because that also, if households use their bank to make payments, then they were less likely to switch. So then that suggested to me that there was also a convenience motive. And I'd like you to push the convenience idea a little bit more. And I think you can. And you mentioned, you know, um, you talked about you did some work on competition, but I don't know if you use the ATM aspect or just the bank availability aspect. But you know, the whole idea of competition and availability and convenience is um, is related not only to the bank branch but also to the ATMs that are in the area. Um, also, you note that uh, during this time period, Italian banks uh, underwent uh, consolidation. There was a lot of M and A activity. So the question is, of course, did they close local branches? How, how did that affect um, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, environment within the area of the household? Um, I was surprised at the insignificance of your variable moves. If the household moved, then you found that there was no significant impact on uh, the probability of switching. And that was surprising to me given the convenience motive. So I'm wondering if there's any way for you to uh, measure the distance of the move, whether they stayed within the same, you know, sort of province. I think you had things by province, uh, but but um, but so I mean the the, the broader question, I, I guess, and this I think is my last slide. So so um, uh, you know, my, you said that bank, households are more loyal to cooperative banks, and so what services do they provide that make households more loyal to them? Um, and, and I think that an answer can be given by the fact that your sample period spans the financial crisis, in which you know, a lot of the switching may not have been voluntary. It may have been involuntary. If the bank shuts down, you're switching banks, right? If the, um, so if, you're, if your mortgage is, uh, is um, uh, if you default on your mortgage, you're going to be likely to switch banks. So, um, you know, I'm not sure how much of this is a voluntary uh, decision. I'd like you to talk about, you know, controls that include, say, maybe bank liquidity variable. You know, banks may have been, even if they didn't close down, they may, some of the banks may have been uh, shrinking their consumer business, whereas the uh, cooperative banks may not have. And so uh, they may have made it more costly or more difficult for households to do business with them. And you might actually have it an almost a bank run effect if the bank is um, is uh, is riskier. I don't know if there's deposit insurance in uh, in Italy, but certainly the other services would be impacted if the bank has um, a potential risk of default. So um, so I think that that's something that you want to take into consideration. So I think so. I guess this is really my last slide. So um, uh, so uh, again, I um, I'm, I'm concerned. If it's a voluntary, if the bank initiated the switch, that it wasn't a voluntary, voluntary uh, switch. Instead, um, it, it's something that comes out of uh, bank distress or the closing of branches and services. And, um, and I'd like to understand that better. But I give you a lot of credit. This is a very interesting, rich paper, and I, I enjoyed reading it. Thank you very much. OK. Should we take one question? <laughs> I'd like to know the, the structure of the banking industry in Italy, um, and I think when you're when you're giving this to an international audience, you should discuss that, because it seems to me that, I mean, if if this was a paper based on U.S. data, there's no way that moved could be insignificant. Um, I mean, we've got maybe four banks in this country 
that have a presence in most major cities. If you're doing business with any other bank and you move to a different city, you would probably change your bank. And it's, it's, you know, it's really important because you discuss this, this, this mortgage motivation, but if you're taking out a mortgage, it could be because you've moved. So you know, really controlling for that moved correctly would be important. And I think discussing the, the structure of the industry would be important. Yeah, that, um, we didn't have time, but we have the uh, structure of the industry. So we control, um, move is only 2% of the sample. So it's very, there is no move in household in Italy. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> people don't move. <laughs> they stick with the, so we, we, we <laughs> so is. If you don't mean they I think he means they don't move from one city to another. Yes, yes. They, they, they don't clarify. move in this, in this sense. So we have all the data on moving, the, the descriptive statistics show that it's only 2%. So then let me try to go quickly on your, from, from backward. So um, we, con we had some measure called inflow, outflow, how many households uh, uh, took the bank or leave that particular bank. So there is no uh, bank run effect because usually is uh, almost, uh, you know, on the macro level, they are, uh, we have the same uh, percentage on this uh, inflow and outflow for each bank. So we have uh, in a previous version of the paper this to control for uh, banks run. Okay, so banks didn't experience the net change. Right? The net change is, uh, is, is, not, zero? is yeah. close to zero. Really? It's not like huge negative or huge positive. Then um, for a uh, bank that shut down, we have no bank that failed during the crisis. <laughs> and we, have, we control as, as we can for uh, bank performance uh, variable. Uh, about the uh, Erfindal index, we use uh, ATM at province level using uh, so the um, number of ATM by banks, and we also have the number of branches. About the uh, consumer credit uh, portfolio management and uh, payment, they, have, they are significant, but they are negative sign. So they, they explain the cost of switching. What we want to push is that the only positive sign is on add or drop mortgage. Uh, about the Bersani, um, the Bersani happens at the beginning of one wave, while the crisis happened at the end of the wave. So we have explanation for this, and we believe that if you took the result on uh, Bers the diff in diff plus the competition, of course we had a, a, a stock of also that were willing to change the bank, but because of the refinancing fee, they were staying with the bank, and then we have a, this huge uh, switch of 30%, but then we showed that competition reduced the switch because now when you decide to open a mortgage, for, so for the new mortgage, people already are able to choose, let's say, the right bank from the beginning, but still we have the 20% that is flat uh, and stable over time. So this is, uh, and also we control for M&A, that is, uh, it does not affect. So we have a different uh, also measure for m and And as I said, MOVE is, uh, is something that we know that we, have, we are aware that uh, when we look at a paper on US market, MOVE is always uh, significant. But unfortunately, people don't move in Italy. So that's, <laughs> that's the point. So that's okay. I think it's time. So, see you tomorrow. <laughs>